Hey everybody, uh, it's Chapo here. Uh, this is our this is our first uh, actual episode um, recorded on the road. We're in uh, Los Angeles right now. I know you will probably be very disappointed to you know have have our unbroken streak of live episodes. They love them so much from you. But as a consolation prize, we've got from the LA Chargers Justin Jackson in the room. How you doing, Justin? Uh, I'm doing well. Thanks for having so, me. So yeah. On the, uh, the show. We're going to be talking about uh, football of both the college and professional mm. variety today. So this is a sports ball. Sports ball. Huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll be talking sports. So, you know, there, there goes half of our listeners. <laughs> oh, God. But, you know, uh, dear listener, um, if you, you, you cannot see me right now, but I just would like it, um, you know, for the record. I'm wearing my uh, UW uh, Badgers sweatshirt. Disgusting. And I just I want it. I didn't even notice I, that. I, I, I hate it. you now. I, I just want to establish, though, you may not know this about me. I've always, always <sighs> been a huge fan of well, UW Will, Madison Badgers. Will famously on the show is a huge fan of, you know, Wisconsin teams. <laughs> Green Bay. He's the biggest Green Bay Packers fan here. The Milwaukee uh, Bucks. The Brewers. Yeah, yeah, the Brewers. This is outrageous. <laughs> all of it. All of <laughs> this them. This is outrageous. Valor I mean, well, he's wearing. Look at what he's wearing. Yes, look. <laughs> Dude, the shirt, the sweatshirt does not lie. They don't give those out to just anyone. I love, I love, I love Benny the Badger. This is outrageous. He's, he's number one. Um, I support all. I support all their all their teams. I'm Brett serious. Farvey, you yeah. know, one of the top oh, quarterbacks of all time. I'm fuming. I'm fuming. I particularly like Brett Favre's work with the uh, the Jets. That was, oh yeah, his yeah. photography is really my favorite <laughs> yeah. thing about him. Um, so yeah, like I said we're here with uh, Justin Jackson. Uh, Justin, we uh, we just met you for the first time um, in in Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. Were you uh, were kind enough to uh, come by one of our shows, but even kinder to uh, take part in some canvassing for our our coach Bernard Sanders. Right. <laughs> our coach, yeah. And you know, like I know that this is your uh, this is your first time uh, you know doing the canvassing. Uh, mm-hmm. This is you know my first experience a couple of weeks ago, and I was just wondering, um, what was it like for you? I mean, what'd you do? Or- it, it was it was awesome. Like just actually getting on the ground and kind of feeling like you're involved actually physically with your body involved in the, in the, in the campaign and everything. And what was best about it was you were around so many people that kind of shared the same ideology and same pursuit, um, you know, for trying to get Bernie elected and going door to door was, you know, for me, that's like a big step because I never thought I would do anything like that. Um, but I just felt, um, so motivated. I mean, I think you said that like, you know, putting on your pads to play a nationally televised game was like less yeah, anxiety. There's, for there's, there's than, yeah. way less anxiety in that. Um, but I, I told you, your friend George said that you uh, took to a pretty, you were like really captaining the, the canvassing team out there. You were really like, you were hitting it hard. Yeah. I was kind of like, uh, fuck it. I'm just going to kind of go hard at this, <laughs> which is, I don't know, kind of my uh, ideology and anything. Like when you're doing it, might as well just go all in. Um, and I did, I actually got some pretty good numbers. So yeah, uh, pretty okay. proud of myself. Good, on that. excellent stats. Uh, we'll be we break, we're breaking it down later on uh, <laughs> Chapo after the <laughs> after <laughs> after the match. Um, uh, do, do you have any like memorable uh, interactions with uh, um, with any doors you knocked? Yeah, out? one one guy. It seemed like we woke him out of a sound sleep because he came to the door and he just looked so confused. And so we were we kept asking like, "Hey, we're you know here with the Bernie Sanders campaign." Um, you know, trying to let everybody know about the caucus on Saturday. And he just seemed so confused. Like, he was, like, half shaking his head. Like, And then by the end of it, he was like, oh, yeah, yeah, Bernie, I was going to go vote for him. But <laughs> okay. in, the be- in the beginning of it, it seemed like he didn't even know, like, it, what a caucus was. Yeah, so. it takes me a while to uh, get out of uh, when I when I wake up, yeah. you know. Need, need, that, <laughs> need, that, need that coffee. Uh, did you have any, uh, like, any, anyone who didn't like uh, Bernie Sanders? Do you have any negative no, uh, door that, interactions? And I think that's kind of what I knew. And we, we were in mostly working class neighborhoods. But the second um, place we, we canvassed was literally, like, the boonies of Vegas. Like, legit, unincorporated. Everyone has a dog. Like, oh, be, yeah. beware, trespass, keep out. Oh, like, we were, yeah, we were there, too. Yeah, it was just very interesting. Um, but every door we knocked was either someone who either wasn't going to caucus at all or was going to they were strong for Bernie or they were like leaning and kind of just needed a little extra push to go out and caucus for Bernie. So that's kind of when I knew like, oh yeah, he's going to, he's going to crush this. Um, yeah. Like we, when we did our thing, uh, we ended up in very much like the same, one of the same neighborhoods of like North, North Vegas, like almost like where the mountains start. Yeah. And it's like, uh, yeah, like we were in this, uh, like, yeah, trailer park. Every, everyone has a dog in their yeah, yard. Everybody. Everyone has like no trespassing. Do not approach. Beware yeah. of dog. Uh, you know, just cats everywhere. I mean, everyone was super nice to us and we had an, uh, Chris, Matt, and I uh, were doing a thing, and we had a very interesting interaction with 
the sort of uh, trailer park security or manager. It was sort of like a, a Mr. Leahy and Randy situation. <laughs> uh, I was thinking, you know, this large shirtless man approached us asking us what we were doing there. No, it was this, uh, this woman who was uh, just driving a pickup truck, and she was like the security for the, uh, the trailer park that we were in. And she approached us cause it's just like a, a group of you know strangers walking around with clipboards, and she just wanted to know like you know what, Hassan what, Piker has a <laughs> fucking backpack on his chest <laughs> stuffed with modems, <laughs> so that he can dream himself doing yeah. doing canvassing. Yeah, Hassan was looking like some sort of like hype beast cyborg yeah. out there <laughs> walking through this you know yeah walking through this trailer park so like it was it was, it was I, a I guess, robo influence yeah it was an odd sight and she just approached us you know she pulls up in the pickup and uh, wants to know what we're doing there and we just say oh like you know we're out canvassing for bernie sanders we're you know just uh, making people wear the the caucus or whatever and she was uh, a little taken back because she was like oh you're the first people i've seen i've never seen anyone in this neighborhood doing it because she was like oh this neighborhood's scary like this is a bad neighborhood. And like, I mean, I don't know what it's like after dark or whatever, but you know, the, like I said, every person we interacted with, it was, you know, pretty much pretty cordial and nice mm -hmm. to us. Um, there was a couple of people who were just like, no, not interested. Don't yeah. want to hear it. But you know, everyone was nice. And she started talking to us, you know, she was interested in, in, in politics and the campaign. And she said, you know, well, me and my husband are, we're Trump voters and we're going to, we're going to vote for him a second time, you know, like, so you're not going to, not going to shake me off, uh, <laughs> shake me off this perch. But then, like, the, the more she got into it, the most interesting thing she said to us was she said that uh, she voted for Obama in 2008. And she said she voted for Obama because she thought he was going to give everyone health care. And then she said, well, and then I found out that, like, us getting health care meant that we would just have a tax to buy health care from someone else. Mm -hmm. And, like, we already have a problem with that. So, like, why would I believe, you know, any promises to, to, of, of the same from another candidate or whatever? And I thought that was interesting, but even more interesting is when she said, um, me and my husband are evangelical Christians, so, like, we can't support Bernie Sanders because we don't believe in, like, the socialism that he espouses. Right after she got done saying that she didn't, she lost faith in, you know, politics and Obama or the Democratic Party because his health care plan wasn't socialist <laughs> enough. Right. It, it, was, it was strange. But, um, yeah, we, you know, I tried to give him the, you know, we tried to give her the pitch about, you know, <laughs> Vote for Bernie in the primary, so Trump has an easy opponent in general. <laughs> but uh, I don't think we got very far with that. So, Justin, um, just in terms of like you uh, coming to this experience, making the, the Bernie journey for a first time, like when, when did you first become aware of uh, Bernie Sanders and started to like want to get involved or like you know root for him? Um, actually, so in the 2016 election, I was 18, um, so it was the first time I could vote and. I was just so encapsulated, and that was my senior year, and just obviously trying to make it to the league and everything, and just doing everything I could, um, training and everything. So just while that everything was going on, I just wasn't super plugged in until the general. So I kind of missed the primary, unfortunately. Um, but that's kind of when I got politically active, um, and I think it was a wake up call kind of for a lot of, especially my generation. Um, and, and so just from then on out, like I got super into independent media because the I could even tell at, at that young age um, that the uh, corporate media was absolute trash and didn't really talk about anything substantive. So, um, yeah, I got involved with a lot of um, independent left media, and then that's kind of brought me all the way to here where I'm a lot more involved. And really what pushed me over the edge was just how much the media was just shitting on Bernie. And it was, it just mm -hmm. it just made me so angry and mad, and I'm like, you know what? I'm just I'm gonna go there. And I'm gonna, you know, be a part of it and knock doors, if 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 not for anything other than just to inst just to spite the corporate media and the yeah. MSNBC and CNN and all these people that um just talk so much crap about the guy just trying to help poor people and working <laughs> yeah. people. Um, what well, what kind of stuff specifically in the mainstream media? I, I so I was I was at home. Um, I hadn't decided to come to Vegas yet, and. I was just sitting on on my couch, and unfortunately, my father watches MSNBC a lot. Yeah. There's a lot I think there's a lot of people's parents out there who have the uh, the MSNBC yeah. Uh, yeah brain brain parasite. Yeah, but it's weird because I I've completely convinced him and my stepmom to to be Bernie Bros. Excellent. <laughs> um, but you know I, he just can't kind of disconnect himself from that. That's okay. Um, so I was sitting there, kind of. You should get your dad and Adam's dad in the room together <laughs> and have an MSNBC off. Yeah. I don't know if anyone would be my dad. He, he, <laughs> wa he literally watches it all the time. Anyway, um, so I'm sitting there watching it, and this was, they were having, uh, I can't remember if it was Brian Williams or Chris Mads or whatever. They were having kind of like a a thing where they, you know, talk to a bunch of 
random people that are, you know, different supporters of different candidates for, for Las Vegas. And they literally talk to every candidate except Bernie Sanders. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Which, as we know now, is just so disingenuous because he <laughs> had almost 50 percent support. So they pretty much probably had to go out of their way not to find a Bernie Sanders supporter. So if they're not bashing him openly on the network, they're just ignoring him. And that and and that I think speaks so much to their bias. But I also think that people see through that shit now. Um, obviously, as you can see, when he with him giving, getting almost fifty percent of the vote, so that's encouraging at least. Sorry, this might be a tangent, but you just made me think of something. How much MSNBC does your dad watch exactly? Oh, it's it's a lot. Like, is he just sitting there and it's on all day? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I know that there are people who do this, but has it any has it occurred to anyone that? That's not right. <laughs> like, well, because MSNBC, it's supposed to be news, right? It's like, ostensibly, this is to keep you informed. And you watch, like, oh, you should probably only need to watch, like, an hour of news. Right. Be like, okay, I get the gist of what's going on in the world. So the concept of binge-watching this, like, mm -hmm. watching an entire, like, just six-hour stretch of it, uh, it's not just, you know, destroying your brain. I'm saying, like, you're going into this with something, you know, something's not right here. And it's either that... Maybe it tricked you and it sucked you in because, like, you know, I watch MSNBC. I have it on in the background to keep tabs on it. And it's just every 15 minutes, it's like, wow, big new revelation in the Russia scandal. I think uh, let's go to a guy who's going to say, I think uh, I think this one might do Trump in. Uh, so, you know, it's like so they've got to, like, obviously play up the, the fucking uh, the, the sensationalism, the drama every, you know, 15 minutes to keep you hooked in. But also, I mean, I don't know, like, how do you? Are people just getting tricked into it, or is it like I think uh, people? Is it like I just want to watch news all day? <laughs> I think people just like like having a TV on. I mean, like this. I, I never did with like cable news, thank God. But like this reminds me, like my experience with that would be like at the, you know, in my in my, my twenties at the height of my the at the peak of my fail existence of like just unemployment and just avoiding reality. I would watch fucking like ESPN and sports shit on TV all day because it was just this like background hum of shit to keep my brain occupied until about five or six o'clock and i'm like oh this is when a normal person would be getting off work so yeah the rest of the day is uh, gravy I'm, I'm, i've i've made it this far and <laughs> don't have to face the grim reality of my life anymore but yeah like just yeah sports center uh yes network would have mike and the mad dog come on at one o'clock the broadcast <laughs> of the radio show this was this is a low point in my life <laughs> <laughs> But thankfully, wow, World <laughs> Series of Poker 2003. <laughs> yeah. Ah, Dan Harrington, ready for a comeback. No, I totally, I had the exact same experience. That moment when part of the interruption came on. Yes. Like, yeah. Ah, here like, we go. I made it. Oh, thank God. <laughs> yeah, it was like, it was like finding, finding you're like uh, out at sea and you find a fucking piece of flotsam to carry you. <laughs> and it was like, <laughs> carry you on the tide. When, when, when Tony Reali and Around the Horn came yeah, on at five, yep. it's like you could see dry land. Yeah. You're yeah, like, yeah. oh, that guy made it through another day. Thank so God. it's just it's just pleasing colors and yeah. sounds. Yeah, about the yeah, and it's, so. and it's and it's someone to like, you know, it's someone in your house talking to you. That's mm -hmm. nice. And also, I mean, I think it's like the same mm -hmm. thing as like as ESPN or like sports cable news coverage is like they have to fill like twenty four hours of the day yeah. with just information, I guess. But it's not all new information. It's just, like, no. just it's just. And I, and I also think it's one is the age we're in, right? The age of Trump, where it's like. You never know what's gonna what's gonna pop up. So it's almost like people are waiting for something to happen. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. And and the other hand, the the news has turned almost into like in TMZ or E News, right? Where it's like everything is so sensational. So it's almost like entertain like it's yeah. almost entertainment in a sense where they're also trying to get informed, but they're also just watching for them to shit on Trump, which they do so often. So it's kind of just pleasing. It's entertainment. Like this is this obviously been a critique of the news media for a few decades now, but it just. I don't, just during the Trump administration, it's like it's gotten worse. It's it's drastically gotten worse. What's on MSNBC? And it is actually corrosive at this point. Like I do view it as as bad to the, the body politic or whatever, to whatever degree that that matters anymore as Fox News 100%. is and has yeah, been. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. Absolutely. And anyone who's got a family member who's who's suffering right now <laughs> from this problem, you know, you you know what I'm talking about. Just get them to switch over to ESPN, you know. At least it's like it's 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 the same like mindless chatter and like non information, but it's about something that's sort of separate from, you know, 
politics or just you know reality. It's like it's it's a contest. It's a contest and competition and things, but the stakes are just much lower. <laughs> well, he, uh, this is actually reminds me because I was just editing the last San Diego episode. That thing you said on stage about how we should absolutely have a government program that produces a show. Yeah, this where is it's just idea. like. Be- Pete Buttigieg is the president in this show and he you can himself. just watch it and he yeah. plays himself and you can just watch it and it's just a show. They should do that and yeah. have it run 24 hours a day and you can just have yeah. that, the fake politics going in the background. What we should all do collectively is figure out a way to create counterfeit versions with deep fake technology mm-hmm. of both Fox News and MSNBC and mm. then reprogram our family's televisions so that they go to that and they think they're watching their favorite channel, but they're actually watching this deep fake version of it with a completely fictional cast of people, like fictional characters instead of actual politicians, so that they literally won't even know what's happening outside of their home and they'll just get invested in that. Here's my proposal. Okay. We you know, we build a whole Oval Office set and a whole Congress set and we like cast all of that stuff. You know, we cast a whole cabinet, you know, hundreds and hundreds of actors, and they're working twenty four seven. Like their entire lives are doing the show, but they're act, but you know, they're actors and we just shoot them from all angles so that we can produce a multitude of television networks that describe the news that these actors are making. So it's just a sprawling project to create a, 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 a simulacra. Yeah. 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 Basically a sim- a simulacrum of uh, our politics. And, you know, we, we, you could have like our own uh, uh, ersatz Fox news that, you know, let's say the uh, president's a, uh, um, a Democrat, the fictional president's a Democrat, and they're always mad at him. And like we have a, a, a whole series of like talking heads who are themselves actors, uh, who are uh, themselves a part of the cast. And it's just you know just this massive project. I mean, this can be a part of the Green New Deal. That would be my <laughs> proposal. I mean, that's you know it's going to cost a lot of money, and you know, hey, some people aren't going to be able to plant trees. Okay, let's be real here. I guess just uh, more broadly, I think like you know people would be be interested just in. Uh, Sort of uh, your your political evolution because you know I I know it was like just not even that long ago that you know we became aware of you through uh, Twitter and it was just thing like holy shit there's there's a Bernie bro NFL player <laughs> and you know I think people were were interested in that because if you know you come from from our circle you just assume that you know everyone who's online and supporting Bernie Sanders is some kind of you know bitter weirdo uh, <laughs> who deeply resented all the people who were good at sports in high school and college and things like that. So they're, they're reaching out. They, they want, they want someone who uh, will take up that mantle from the, the world of, uh, you know, mainstream achievement and uh, at- athletic endeavor, shall we say. So I guess just like, did you grow up in a household where politics was something that was discussed a lot or, or like, not, how did you come to this? No, not really. And that's why, I mean, I felt like I was a Democrat and, just because my parents were type thing, which I think a lot of people can, a lot of people feel the same way or, or have that same experience. But I think a big, a big part of my evolution was college actually, because I went to Northwestern, you know, which is kind of funny. It's like, it's the nerd college, right? But we're in the big 10. Some people don't even know where we are. I also uh, went to Northwestern and can agree that from a non-sports playing person there, it is equally hilarious that we have a big 10 sports team there. Exactly. I mean, I'm like doing fucking theater projects. <laughs> <laughs> 48 hours a day. Yeah, so um, already kind of on the, the outskirts, right, of, of college football, um, although we were very good uh, when I was there. Um, so I guess, yeah, so my experience kind of started there um, because we had a lot of very intelligent people on our team. You know, I don't think a lot of us were very politically intelligent just because, like I said, I think the age of Trump kind of heightened everyone's awareness of this stuff. But during Obama, the Obama years, you know, pretty much the left was asleep and Mm-hmm. Um, there just wasn't a lot of talk. You wouldn't, you didn't see a wall to wall news coverage about this stuff. So I just think it was easier to not, you know, be as involved. Um, but we had a lot of very uh, deep social um, type of and cultural type of discussions. Um, but I remember one time I was at spring break, I think my junior year, and you know I've I've uh, pretty much a group of very close friends, um, and we were in Denver. Um, and we were, it was just a late night. I'm sure we were all probably drunk or something. And we started to get talking about politics. Um, and I think a few of them, you know, from Texas, obviously kind of Republican. Um, and then, you know, myself, you know, I, I'm sitting there, you know, a black man. And Obama's the president. And, my, you know, my whole culture tells me, oh, he's the best president ever and all this type of stuff. And then so I'm trying to sit there and argue my case for why Obama's a good president. But I don't know shit. Like, I literally, yeah. I know nothing about um, 
what he's done or any of that type of stuff because I just hadn't paid attention. And that's kind of when it clicked in my brain, like, damn, I should really, like, actually start doing some research if I want to actually speak on these issues from a place of knowledge and not just look like an ignorant asshole, which I think it's easy to do. So that's kind of the beginning moment. So it was like when you, when you started to uh, try to find a way to talk intelligently and defend Obama's record, <laughs> that you began to realize that, oh, wait, this guy actually isn't a good president? Yeah, well, I think at the time I, I just didn't know. And then once I started doing a lot more research, um, it was it was very, I guess, disheartening to find out a lot of the stuff um, that – you know, he capitulated on or just failed to do, you know, obviously I'm a very anti-war person. So all the drone bombing, all that type of stuff, expanding the wars, it's just, it's very disheartening for me because I would love to be able to say the first black president was super progressive and he fought for the working class and for poor people and for my people. He went to Flint, he fixed the pipes, he didn't leave till that, till that was done, like all this type of stuff. But it's just, it's just not the case and it's not based in, rea in reality. So that's just not something I can say. And that's, a huge reason why I, you know, didn't, you know, chose kind of to reject Hillary Clinton's type of politics and accept Bernie Sanders' type of politics. I mean, it, it I guess it sort of runs counter to like a, a stereotype that people may have about, you know, uh, athletes at a college or professional level. But would would people be surprised based on your experience at like the, the kind of political uh, awareness or like orientation of people in, involved at like sports at that high a level? I think I think what I've found out through college and, and especially through the NFL is um it really is about class. Like it it really transcends race, I think. Um and, and it's it's very upsetting to me because I know that a lot of my peers come from these neighborhoods that are um destitute, that feel like, you know, they don't there's not a lot of opportunities there and and for a lot of people, like, if you didn't play sports or you didn't rap, or you, you know, like, it was hard to get out because the schools are so bad and there's no jobs. Um, and so I know that if this was explained to a lot of the people that, you know, the type of people that are, you know, in the locker rooms in the NFL that come from those places, like, I feel like they would be more on board with it. But because it's um, – because you kind of have to go out of your way, especially once you're comfortable with your own life, once you have to ha have to go out of your way to – um, see these things and research these things and understand these things on a deeper level, I think, um, like I said, once you get comfortable, it's kind of easy not to do that. So, like I said, I think if it was explained, I think more people would be on board, but it's just, I don't think it's as apparent, unfortunately, in those spaces. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, kind of since we're on your like college experience here, um, I know uh, around when you were playing or maybe slightly before it, there was a big push to unionize yeah, the right. Northwestern football team. Mm -hmm. um, and that was after my time there, but I was, you know, kept an eye on that because I thought it was very cool and right and mm -hmm. good. Um, and I was just reading um, Sports Illustrated did a good follow up on like why it didn't come together um, that I thought was really interesting. But were you, and I'll link it in the show notes. But were you involved in any of that or did that affect any of your, your thinking around then? No. Well, I was not involved. Um, I was. That was the year before I came in. And so I was watching it all go down. I had already committed and everything, and I was planning on being there in the summer. And I think this all kind of went down in the spring or winter of my senior year of high school. So, But I do remember, I think, I actually remember tweet. I think I tweeted about it. Um, and I was not active on Twitter at all. That was like 2013. That was kind of when I first joined, I think. I, think I remember tweeting about it. And then I actually remember um, one of my future teammates – texting me and saying oh no don't like don't comment on that you don't know you don't know what's going on behind the scenes so you had committed and you had commented on it in a public forum and they were like hey like yeah they were like yeah they kind of like asked it and at that time i was like oh shit my bad like <laughs> you, you found know. you found felix's old account you found the, you found the swarthy <laughs> villain account reached to that you got a call from the athletic director saying you know ixnay on that <laughs> um so yeah i didn't i didn't i wasn't a part of it going in but i think at the end of the day i think it was a very a uh, noble thing to do because of the fact that at Northwestern, we got treated very well. Our coach, you know, we have a very good coaching staff, very good administration. Our athletic director is awesome. And so we did get treated very well at Northwestern, but it really was an issue with the rest of the schools where, I mean, it's a lot different now, but at that time people weren't getting guaranteed scholarships. So if you got hurt, you could just get cut. And then, you know, your entire career and is kind of cut from underneath you. Um, and so there was a lot of different problems that we were fighting for that we didn't necessarily have a problem of ourselves, but we knew that was going around around college football. Yeah. I mean, again, from reading that sports illustrated article, um, you know, I was, I was struck by how, 
you know, how for a lot of people, you know, I certainly didn't think about healthcare in college and how acute that yes. experience of interacting with the necessity of absolutely guaranteed healthcare yes. at that level is and could be as like a way to raise consciousness about how bad things are. And the other thing that I thought was interesting, again, to like break the stereotypes of what college athletes are thinking is one of the main organizers, their main one of their main issues is that they really wanted to be pre-med and do football. Yeah. And there was just no way to balance the academic schedule with the football schedule. And he basically had to bet on football yeah. and then, you know, if things didn't pan out. So I thought, I, I just thought that that was very, um, it's a very interesting issue. Uh, and I mean, especially like the, like, especially about the issue about like, um, like non-guaranteed scholarships. So there's like a one year scholarship yeah. where they're like, and, you know, again, if you're, if you're someone for whom football is like your opportunity, like, like that's your opportunity to go to college or like yeah. do something after college or something like that. And then you get like a one year scholarship that's contingent on you being good enough. <laughs> yeah. Like that's, or if you get hurt or something like mm -hmm. that's so like what, you know, as part of like, you know, being a college experience or like thinking more about politics, was your interaction like, you know, with college football, with the NCAA at that, at like the highest level? I mean, did that radicalize you at all or did that open your eyes to like uh, some of these same issues about like class and ownership yeah. and things like that? I th yeah, I think on a base level, I mean, they don't they don't really want to consider us workers. But at the end of the day, we are a part of a multi-billion dollar business um, and we are the product. Right. So. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter what nomenclature you want to give to it. Like we are, we are workers, right? And um, for us to be, for us to not receive any type of compensation outside of our scholarship, which we, as a collective group, completely outperform that on a monetary level. Um, for us to not see those benefits, uh, you know, I think it's wrong. I think it's just it's just straight up wrong. But at the at the, you know, I think people always want to make the conversation that. You know, how do you split the money and all that type of stuff? I think we can figure that out if you really, you know, try. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I don't think it's say, oh, it's difficult, so let's just not do it. Um, but I think what was really degrading for me um, in this whole experience was that our name was stripped away from us, right? So mm -hmm. we couldn't, I couldn't go back home and be like Justin Jackson football camp while I was in college and make money off of that. Otherwise, I wasn't considered an amateur anymore. So they literally strip your name from you. Um, which is just disgusting and, and it's a way it's it's just a way to push workers down like in a sense of, of that space. It's a way to suppress workers' rights and suppress our ability to earn money in those four years where guess what? Only one or two percent of those people are actually gonna end up making yeah. it to the uh, league. Yeah, yeah. And so I mean like the number of like the best football player in your high school like it's a tiny majority you know minority of them that can make it to a d1 right. school with a scholarship and then it's an even smaller minority of that that ever make it to the nfl right. like it's really really a tiny tiny fraction and then like especially again even if you have a good college career you could never get in the nfl or also injure yourself in such a way that you'll never play professional sports ever again right and on the name thing it also just must be really surreal to be thinking about you know as like at age 18 walking into like the Norris University Center and right. and seeing your like your name on merch that they're selling there for fifty dollars and being like I will never see any of that money right. unless I go get the chance to go pro from here. I mean, I, it's it's like and then the base hypocrisy also going back to the school and the academic thing is that when you were saying oh we are workers there even though they want to treat us like students, but then when you're like hey I want to be a student and take this class, they're like no absolutely not you cannot go to that class you have to go to this whatever you know training is scheduled that day yeah definitely at the end of the day <laughs> i mean not not as much at northwestern but yeah like the pre-med thing we couldn't do pre-med just because of what time our practice was and all the pre-med classes were in the morning so that was just not an option um but i'm, I'm sure at a lot of other schools like academics just doesn't take precedent over yeah, sports right. um and it's just it's just a stark reality of it um even if they try to want to you know reserve or keep uh, maintain the sanctity of college sports and college athletics and these you know people that play as student athletes but at the end of the day it's 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 about the money and it's about um the sport which everyone loves so i think if we can actually come to some type of agreement on how the people that are providing the product for this multi-billion dollar business can receive a percentage of that um Back into their pockets. And, you know, when you talk about uh, athletes as, as workers for, you know, the, the, they're part of a, yeah, again, like you said, a multi-billion dollar business that is also part of, attached to an educational institution. But when you talk about workers, another interesting thing is the coaches, they're workers. Right. And in a lot of states, 
they're the highest paid public worker on the entire state payroll. Right. Like by a long shot. Like oh, the, yeah. the, the coach of the, yeah, the coach of the like the big college, like the public university college football team, they're paid millions of dollars in taxpayer money. Like they're they're workers. Right. You know, but I guess like they're I guess professionals at their job. I guess the whole the whole amateur thing doesn't doesn't extend to uh the coaches of these giant like, you know, football schools. Yeah, and I mean you see Right, Lane Kiffin, he used to be USC, and then he goes and co- coaches at it was either Florida International or Florida Atlantic. Is he having that same type of success there? Of course not, because um, the players are much better at a school like USC, and he's going to get paid much more. So where's the difference in his paychecks, right? The difference is made up by the players who are providing a better product, therefore mm-hmm. making more money for the school and for the, for the institution and for the um, NCAA as a whole. So I think it's just... I mean, it's so obvious to every single person um, outside of it, but for some reason, it's just too difficult to figure out the terms. <laughs> That's what they'll tell you. So, uh, like, you go from the experience of, you know, playing football at the highest level, at, like, of college and Big Ten school and the NCAA, and, like, the NCAA, you know, is a literal cartel. Like, they, they act as, they, they fill that definition, like, dictionary to a T. Then you get into the NFL, right? Yeah. Which is, like, you know, it, it, it's it's a private you know corporation that represents you know the interests of all of these the owners of these sports franchises, but it is a you know it's a private enterprise of which like you know it's it's clear who you know you get paid you know you get you get you get a, you get your you sign your you sign your contract you get paid uh, you know but going to the experience of the NFL like even though you're getting paid for it doesn't like many of these like savage. Uh, inequalities and, and greed and like you know hyper exploitation and commercialization of sports does it become even more apparent when you get into the NFL or is it be, or is it like a little different um it's interesting it is obviously such a huge business right it's the biggest business uh, sports wise and in, in the country um so I mean you see how everything is monetized you see how everything is I don't know it's just the experience is a lot different um and you there's a lot of parallels to college, I mean, other than the fact that you get paid, right? So that's why another reason why I believe um, the college athletes should get paid. But um, the NFL, it's like, well, well there, I think a lot of people have a, a kind of bad idea of, like, everyone thinks that everyone gets paid, like, the best players, right? Yeah. But essentially, like, 60%, 70% of the guys are, we, we are the working class, right, of the NFL. Um, so like there's the guys whose names and faces, you know, which right. is a very small part of the NFL because right. you know, you're wearing that helmet right. most of the time, you know, most of the people like filling out a roster of an NFL team, even if you're a fan of the team, you probably wouldn't recognize them if they were walking down the street other than like a few of the big, you know, right. star positions. Right? Exactly. Exactly. So the majority of us, and that's why there's a lot of parallels to, um, just the, in general, the general population is that we are the working, a lot of us are the working class of, um, the NFL and, you know, there's not guaranteed contracts for us, and, and we have to come in every single day. And there's always a risk of of getting cut, getting traded, getting moved. And and there's a lot of there's a lot of background to it that I think a lot of the general public doesn't really think about. Um, and you know, the job security just isn't great, right? So you have to go into it with a a different type of mindset. And I think that takes a oh, I think another I think that's another reason why a lot of people don't get too involved in in politics and the other stuff is because you have to be so hyper focused on your job and and just continuing to stay there and and be in it because this is what you worked your whole life for and it can be taken away from you in a second. So I think that's a lot of reason why you know people just are so hyper focused and intense and and into what they have to do just to to continue to thrive in in a business that has very little job security is very cutthroat. Well, I mean, and you know, the other thing, like the non guaranteeing contracts, the NFL is the only sports league. Like, you right. know, if you're a baseball player, you could sign a sixty million dollar contract and then sprain your, you know, fall off a bike or whatever, and you'll be yeah. getting paid for the rest of your fucking yeah. life. Exactly. Move on, or, baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, or yeah, same with the the NBA. Like you know, I mean, there's a, a long list of terrible contracts that've been given out, but at least those guys are getting paid. Right. The NFL, if you get injured, they'll, they'll cut you, and you get no money. Yeah, you get no money. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and again, like I guess from the the owners or the team perspective, they're like, well, it's just like it's by far and away the most violent sport, where it's like the mo- you're the most right. prone to injury. So like, why would we be guaranteeing all this money? That's like not right. But I mean, it seems. Do you lose your health coverage too? I mean, you get workers' comp, so. Um... I don't think you necessarily lose your health coverage. No, you don't. If you get hurt, you don't lose your health coverage until. I mean, they'll pay for 
even if you get released, they have to. They, I think they're yeah, obligated yeah. to pay. What happened on the job? Right, happened yeah. on the exactly what happened on the job. Um, but like, just you know, like you mentioned, the NFL is like it's, it's the biggest sports business in America. Yeah. Football is the most popular sport by far. The NFL like, makes by far the most money. It, it yeah. is kind of like a national religion of this yeah. country, and it 100%. is this kind of. Uh, you know, it, it, like it is, it is America's sort of gladiatorial games. Yes. You know, like the the football is our modern coliseum, yes. and like, uh, so like there's a strange dynamic as well, like culturally, like you know, especially if you're thinking about you know uh, being a public figure or talking mm-hmm. about things that are political, almost more than anything, like the, the 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 bandwidth for what is acceptable, like when you're you know behind that NFL shield, is so much smaller because it is a very conservative culture the mm-hmm. owners of these teams are mo- a lot of them are very right wing and there's like how do you feel about like the sort of like um, america's cultural relationship with football and the men who play it i think i think the overall like idea that people have of football right is this, it's what they do on their week they they watch it on their weekend or they'll go to the game or they'll sit on their couch on a sunday and they, they watch football right and so i think a lot of the times they want to take our humanity out of it because for a lot of people it's their entertainment and right they don't think of us outside of that space outside of us on the football field right and so and the fact that we're in helmets and and there's there's more 53 of us on each team there's 32 teams so there's so many of us as opposed to basketball right where everyone's more visible Mm -hmm. and the starters are playing most of the minutes they're getting most of the attention everything um so i think it's it's harder for people to see us as actual humans and as and kind of take our humanity, I think they take our humanity for granted, right? And that's Mm -hmm. why when you see people speak out, whether it's about politics or about mental health or about anything like that, it's like people are so taken aback by it because they're like, oh my gosh, they're actually humans, they're actually regular (laughs) people with real thoughts. Yeah. Um, So I think kind of just being in it for me, it's always like I'm never compromising my values. Like when, when when I'm saying stuff, I'm never punching down. I'm never disparaging the other side. I'm never saying, you know, F Trump, F this, F that. Because I understand that there's a lot of reasons that people feel the way they do. And, you know, if if you're out there being, for me, if, if I'm out there just speaking my mind and, and kind of seeing myself as more than a football player, but as an actual human being, as a citizen of this country with real views and, and, um, and, and ideology and, and me wanting to see, you know, my the candidate that I like get elected for the majority of people, even if so, it's not so much for myself, but it's for other people. I feel like that's something that is to be admired and isn't, isn't to be uh, looked down upon or, or kind of admonished or ostracized for. Just on that humanity comment, as you were saying that I just had like the grim realization of just how dark it is that Fox's football logo is literally a robot. Uh, yeah. Yeah. An yeah. NFL player. Yeah. That they're like, because in, yeah. in a subliminal way, it's like how they want to message yeah. that is like, like you're not seeing people. These are just machines that are built for your your like enjoyment to crash into each other. It's a it's a very grim symbol for the well, for the know, league. You uh, know, as Andrew Yang points out, in about twenty years, most football players will be replaced <laughs> by automatons. It will be uh, it will be robot jocks. And that's why, you know, you guys deserve a thousand dollar check <laughs> to compensate for your unemployment and use that money and make a startup. Right. <laughs> also, Cletus will be human, strangely enough. But like, you know, speaking of like the uh, like the, 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 the MAGA people, the Trump people, like, you know, I, I, would, I would imagine the Venn diagram of them and football fans is uh, pretty much a circle. Um, I think if like you really drill down in like a lot of these people who like show up to see Trump at a rally at some fucking stadium, like thirty thousand people wearing wearing the hats and you know just want to see our president. Like what what's the issue that like they want Trump to deal with the most? Like what is their number one political concern? What's the thing that makes them the most angry? It's been consistent in pretty it's much been, every it, oh, interview where people go to these places and ask them what they actually care about. It's Colin Kaepernick. Yeah, it's Colin Kaepernick kneeling during. The national anthem, like that's what they're pissed off about. Like that's because what they, like, he violated their sacred space, their sacred football space. Yeah, so that I wasn't in the NFL at that time, um, and I think the saddest part about that whole ordeal was how the, and this is this is the amazing thing about the the news media, right? Is at at the point it got so you know it became a partisan issue, right? The what he was actually fighting for, what he was actually trying to bring attention to was like never talked about anymore. Right. 
Like, well, it's all about like he's disrespecting the troops, right? right. Like, yeah, yeah, it completely changed from he's protesting. You know, he's using his American right, right, as a citizen to protest again uh, against police brutality of black men, right? And so that's the whole message he was trying to put out there. By, uh, I mean, a few weeks after the whole thing started, like that, you didn't hear that at all. All you ever heard was, oh, he's disrespecting the troops, he's disrespecting the military, all this type of stuff. And and that's the whole saddest part about the whole thing is. He was trying to do, you know, be valiant and, you know, do do something that was, I think, incredible. And it, it got taken to a whole different level when it got partisanized, obviously, when Trump, uh, you know, tweeted that or whatever. And then you kind of he kind of energized his base against against Kaepernick. And it became it just really t- for me, like that's what was the most devastating part about that whole ordeal. Do you think he would be on a team now if it wasn't for that? Oh, I think I think definitely. Yeah. I mean, he was. I mean, he's a Super Bowl quarterback, you know what I mean? And um, I think he was right in his prime. Um, and he was just such a different type of quarterback, especially when you see all these great quarterbacks nowadays. He was a dual-threat quarterback who just made it really tough and difficult for defenses. Um, and so I think, yeah, he would actually fit even more so right in with today's game, um, even then when he was actually playing. And when you think about the quarterbacks who actually got starts while Ka- Kaepernick right. was out of the league, it's like yeah. – there's no way they would not have preferred to have him on the field than yeah, whoever exactly, they were pulling exactly. off of like the XFL roster or whatever. <laughs> well, a, you know, it is just such a creepy thing. Just imagine if like every day when you went into work, you had to fucking do the Pledge of Allegiance. Yeah. On national television. Yeah. yeah. Or just like at your fucking office or and there's whatever. There's going to be a camera on you while you're doing it, and I respond to your reaction to the, the song. And everyone's going to be making sure that you're not doing anything that is disrespectful to the song. <laughs> Rolling your eyes or you can't be or... mean to the song. And yeah, I mean, I can't imagine just having to like keep your face, you know, impassive, even though you probably don't give two tenths of a shit. <laughs> and you know, like, but like you were talking earlier about, like, you know, football is America's game, and like right. so much of football the sport like as it's experienced in america like just is america is like the business of america it's the self-image of america it's the identity of america but that's like a very again very narrow bandwidth of like what is american and what isn't and you know like in the nfl like you know earlier like you know in american history at a time when you know there was a very strong tradition of like big time professional athletes who took very bold radical political stands like Mm -hmm. you know uh Lou Alcindor, who would become Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Bill Russell, Jim Brown, of, and the 68 Olympic team of, of black men in this country taking right. like very radical political stands at a time when, you know, I guess on the surface, America was a more racist country. But that, those, you know, they're hailed for it now, like Ali and guys like that. But they were loathed at the, at the time. time. Yeah. They were absolutely loathed. They were like one of, some of the most hated people in America for mm-hmm. doing that, for disrespecting the Olympics, disrespecting, you know, the, foot, the fans or the, the game or things like that. By, but, you know, like if you wanted to take a political stand, uh, you know, from like, yeah, I think we should bomb Saddam or like, I, you know, supporting the troops is a political stance. Like at the, at, right. the, at the Super Bowl, they unveil a hundred yard American flag and then a stealth bomber flies over the stadium. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty political right, right there, right. you know. So, like, I mean, just, like, from your perspective, like, as, like, you know, like, uh, the cultural resonance of, of football in America is inextricably tied to race in America and always mm-hmm. has been because most of the people who play the sport overwhelmingly are black men. Right. And then, like, it's an audience of, not overwhelmingly, but, like, it's, it's, it's like, you know, white mainstream America that's consuming right. it and loves it more than anything. Mm-hmm. And, like, how do you feel, like, do you, do you feel, like, is, it, is that tension still there? Or like, do you, do you experience that at all? Um... I mean, personally, I don't, and and go. I mean, going to it's awesome going to a Chargers game. There's like actually a huge amount of a Latino population. You know, there's a good amount of Black people. Obviously, there's it's going to be majority white, but there's actually there's very there's an influx of a lot of diversity, which I love to see. I love interacting with our fans who, you know, especially at, at the training camp practices. Like, there's like a lot of Hispanic. We have a very strong Hispanic support base, which is awesome to see. But I think sports. I think for me, sports has always been an amazing place because it's a place, especially when I got to college, where I can interact with people from all teammates and brothers from all over the country. And we don't all have, I mean, there's a, there was a hundred of us in college, so we didn't all have this exact same political views and stuff, but we could actually sit down and talk to each other and we can disagree. And at the same time, I could still love them and we could still, you know, we eat together, we practice together, we play together, all this type of stuff. And I think that's a place where sports brings people together 
Um, and I think that's kind of been taken out of it when you put all the, you know, you put all this partisanship in there and, and all this, you know, F Colin Kaepernick type stuff. It really takes away what sports is supposed to be about which is bringing people of all different backgrounds together, cheering and, and being on the same team for something. And um, and that's what has been so amazing for me with sports is I, f I really feel that. And I felt like that has informed my politics because now I can actually talk to people who are, you know, Republicans, been Republicans, whatever, and we can actually talk about issues without me, you know, resorting to just name calling them. Because you have and, a common experience. Right. Kind we, of, of, I don't know, <laughs> sort of like a discipline or suffering or, or joy at, you know, uh, exactly. achievement or, or winning or something like, yeah. Exactly. So that, that's that been the best part of sports for me. And that's, like I said, it's helped inform my politics. And I think it's helped me be someone who can go out there, speak my mind and advocate for something without absolutely, you know, shitting on or dunking on or disparaging Um other people who ha who have their own reasons for voting and how can I get them to see that those reasons actually are reasons to support my candidate and not the, and not the one they did. But before. it would seem that that door mostly for the most part, either through the media or culture at large only swings one way at this right. point. Yeah? yeah. Like, you know, so it's like, it's, it's not like a completely like a level playing field of mutual respect of like all people's <laughs> beliefs or political stances. When you were saying that about bringing people together, it was making me think about how, to what extent sports in this country have been, exclusively claimed by the right wing as like, this is like a conservative thing to like sports, to be a football fan. Like there is no yeah. space, you know, there's, there's no realm. It's like, ah, the good, the good liberal baseball fan or something. Well, like that's that. because you, because it's got winners. And lip, the left is still like winning. They're whining. They just like to whine. Well, up until now, I'd agree with you. <laughs> right. yeah. They just like whining and participation trophies. Yeah, no, that's, that's definitely interesting. Um, I think, like you said, it's been claimed, but I don't think it's necessarily representative of the fan base. You know, I think there's, I think there's fans that are. I think it might be a more of a representative sample of the country than you would think. But I think, like you said, it's been claimed so loudly, it's been screamed to the heavens by only one side. Um, that I think in our mind, it's kind of been flipped to think that oh, it's just one side that are that are really into that. Um, and then obviously with the cabinet thing, you get the president involved, and then it turns into a whole shitstorm. And then, yeah, like you like you said before, I think it's just the claiming of it um, that has changed everything. But I don't, I really don't necessarily think it's as far as far as the fan base conservatives as you as you would think. So when I used to read Deadspin, you know, when that existed, uh, they would have letters from readers in the "Why Your Team Sucks" annual rundown. Uh, one of my favorite pieces, and uh, there was this common thread. Where, you know, the Deadspin kind of reader base, they're all just like, they're all just like good, nice liberals. And a lot of them are big football fans. But they hated themselves for watching this game. They thought that they were doing something immoral because of uh, its abusive labor practices, its overt jingoism, uh, the way that the fucking uh, players are just straight up fucking dying, like taking years off their life playing this game. What would you say to them? Um, like, can you be a good lib and enjoy sports ball? Sports ball. I think, of course. You know, I think, I think what people don't understand is like how, like for me, sports has been everything, um, and it's just been the experiences that I've gotten from it, the friends I've made, the uh, just the just the ability to like come together and fight for a common purpose. Like, I think that's something that's so strong and powerful and it's helped inform my politics because I, I like being a part of a movement, you know, a team that's fighting for the right thing, you know? And so I don't, I, I think, you know, we obviously give our, we give our bodies up. We, we, we make these sacrifices, but it's really not for, you know, it's not for not. Um, it's for, we, it's because we love the game. We have passion in the game and, we have we have drive and it, it motivates us every single day to wake up and go do this stuff. So I don't think you have to think of it like uh, like it's something that we feel like we have to do. Like, no, there's something that we want to do. And I think it's something that I think sports really I really, really, truly believe that sports brings people together. Um, and I think it, it can take it can take it like a dangerous path if you think of it. In the way that you know, kind of with the whole cabinet thing and how that all that all uh, unfolded, but I think at the foundation and the roots of it is um, 
it's just being a part of a team, being a part of a goal. And and that's why I really love Bernie's movement because I feel like this is a team and where we have each other's backs and we're trying to go out there and we're advocating for the right things and we're willing to fight for it. Um, and I think when you kind of – that that's, reminds me so much of, of the, the teams that I've been on, um, my football teams, my basketball teams, and that's that's really why I love it so much, yeah. So, like, you know – if you if you if you're a fan of football, you enjoy football. You're you're someone who plays it professionally. Um, being aware of the you know conditions of you know even if you're making good money, the conditions of exploitation and particularly the NFL, the you know as we know more and more about the horrendous physical toll that the game yeah. can take on you, uh, even playing it for a very short period amount of t- short amount of time. Yeah. What would like in in your mind be like a what would be like a more like equitable, fair and like decent humane way to structure the NFL and like the way like contracts players and the relationship to owners and the team in general. Yeah. Well, we have our CBA is going to be up in 2021. So all the, you know, the executive committee, the people that we as players on each team kind of voted to have representatives um, at these contractual negotiations and everything and all that stuff is going down now. Um, I think, you know, they've been, they've proposed a few different things, you know, like 17 game seasons and all type of stuff. Um, you know, that I think it's awesome to see a lot of players are speaking out against that um, because of, you know, health reasons or we want more concessions from, you know, the owners and everything. I don't know too much about all that because I'm not super involved in the talks, um, just being a young player and everything. Um, but what I will say is I think that a, a lot of us want to fight for lifetime health, health insurance, obviously because of, like you said, the toll that this game takes on us or uh, – takes away from us really um and uh like you i think we're trying to get you know minimums increased uh for basically the work it's basically a minimum wage increase um for the working class of the nfl we're trying mm-hmm. to get that done we're trying to get a more equitable uh revenue sharing right now i think it's 53 47 in favor of the owners we obviously want to get that as close to 50 yeah. 50 as we can um i mean all that stuff's going down now and i think we are willing as a as a um player base and as a union we are willing to hold out if, if necessary because we really want we really want to to catch up kind of to the other leagues as far as either guaranteeing more of contracts mm-hmm. um lifetime health insurance just really protecting the players because for a lot of us this doesn't last more than three or four years um so we want to get more hands in the pockets of especially the players that are like i said are the minimum wage of the nfl um quicker you know, in Nevada, we just saw the leadership of the culinary union mm-hmm. uh, attack Bernie Sanders, attack Bernie Sanders' Medicare for All proposal, right. uh, attack his supporters online, uh, and then the day of the caucus, Bernie swept those <laughs> the rank and file members of that union mm-hmm. uh, on his way to a resounding victory. And that was kind of a lesson for a lot of people because opposing campaigns like... Uh, you know, Pete Buttigieg says, uh, well, why are uh, Bernie supporters attacking good union members? You know, B- Pete Buttigieg, the guy who, uh, if you ever yeah, seen McKinsey fi- loves unions. Every time they come to a company that has a union, I'm sure the first thing on their agenda is how do we strengthen this union? <laughs> or if you've ever seen the famous video we talked about it a few months ago of Pete Buttigieg walking a picket line for apparently the first time in his Hell life. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and just like kind of... Sp- walking next to this guy who is like increasing his pace so he doesn't <laughs> yeah. have to talk to this freak and saying hey uh how are you how are you holding up how's the uh strike fund doing <laughs> yeah. how much money do you have left in it yeah do you think you're going to a uh, break soon perhaps uh the uh uh perhaps the owners should uh wait a few more weeks do you have uh, any other, do you have any weaknesses that the ownership group doesn't know about it's just like he could it's like I don't even think he was trying to, you know, help the ownership. He just instinctually it's, goes yeah, rat yeah. mode in every instance. Thinks, yeah. His brain, his like rat mode kicks in. And he's like, ooh, I got to find out all I can about these uh, striking workers to crush them later. So Buttigieg, you know, he comes out and he says, well, you know, I like unions. I don't know why Bernie doesn't like unions. When, of course, as uh, Amber points out, well, it's a bit more complicated than that. Right. And as you're talking about, it's a bit more complicated than that. So I'm wondering if in your mind there are, and I understand if you can't talk about this, but if there are parallels uh, between that circumstance in the culinary union and as well uh, a circumstance in, in the players association where yeah like you say there's there's two tiers there's the uh the the working class the guys whose uh position is more precarious and then there's the like the superstars whose names everyone knows and you know they get the big big contracts and yeah, no, i think that's why you kind of have you have to have a diversity of representation 
Um, and I know uh, some of the guys on my team um, that aren't necessarily like the superstar superstars are involved in the talks and everything. And they, I make sure to keep to stay updated with them, so I know how it's going. But like you said, that is something that within the union, I think you have to have that because if it's just the upper, you know, the you know top basically top 10, top 1% of the actual player base uh, that are just in the talks, and you're kind of going to miss the worries and the struggles of the more working class um, players. So you have to have both because you can't just have a, um, you know, a collective bargain agreement that just caters to the top guys because they are, you know, like we see in this country, they are very much so the, the minority of the actual – Player base. Well, I I gotta say, I mean, I do I do like you and wish you well, but I I'm gonna be rooting for the owners because when I <laughs> watch a football game and I've watched a great great contest between two teams, I just know in my heart that who I'm thankful for most is the performance of the owners. <laughs> uh, they really make it possible from their uh, owners box in their <laughs> iron lungs. It's interesting that you bring this up, Matt. Because Will is, as a huge Packers fan, is always talking about the oh fact that oh, yeah. the Green Bay Packers, oh his God. favorite team, furious. Is, furious uh, right uh, has no owner. Yet somehow it functions. Yeah. Somehow it exists. It's weird. It's now, like, was it, like I, the players get to the games on time and they, they <laughs> run plays and they win. I don't understand how that's possible like, without an owner. Matt, you, you brought this up when we were talking about the other day. Uh, can you talk about the, the Toronto Maple Leafs? Oh, yeah. The Toronto Maple Leafs, until relatively recently, were majority owned by the Ontario State Teachers Pension Fund. And that is like one of, that's like the original franchise in the NHL. Yeah. That was yeah, like one yeah, of the yeah, most yeah, storied yeah. teams in and hockey. In fact, they don't they they sold it a few years ago, but they are also the main investor in the Hudson Yards project. In oh, Manhattan. excellent. Great. The, the cool. giant, the giant, the, <laughs> the Euro, gyro structure. Yeah, the gyro structure <laughs> Sorry, that I'm, everyone I'm hates. Just curious about this, but are there any teams that are just like listed on a stock exchange? Like anyone could just. No, no, up? I don't think there are any. I don't think they can be structured that way because all of it is all on the contingent of like antitrust. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah they yeah. are allowed. I mean, like the other thing I wanted to bring up, and like we were just in Las Vegas and like saw a prime, like probably the best example of this with our own eyes. Really, one of the, if you want to talk about from like a leftist perspective, one of the most nauseating things about professional sports is the construction of stadiums with municipal oh funds. Oh, God. And it is just for every single city that gets sucked into this, it is always such a fucking boondoggle. And they always, like, promise, oh, we're going to create all these jobs and shit. And it's like, where they create, like, a couple hundred, like, service yeah. jobs. And then, like, the construction jobs to, to build it, that. But the worst example of this, this new Raiders stadium that they just built in Vegas, they, they apparently... They call it like the Darth Vader because it just literally looks like a stormtrooper helmet right. and all in black. It's like eight hundred million dollars yep. of taxpayer money built that stadium. I think they, they, in the city of Las Vegas footed the entire yep. bill. But then they don't get any equity in the team. That's no. the worst deal you can yeah. possibly make. So if you're going to build these pay, stadiums, I will buy you a thing, and then I get no, I get no part of the team. The thank, no, you, thank you, sir. Thing. Yeah, build the stadiums if you want to attract like you know tourists or a fan base. Uh, you know, well. To, uh, when but we, yeah, the, the, then you should own the team. The city should own the team at that point. Obviously, Chris knows. Uh, in Cincinnati, Mike Brown, one of the worst, cheapest owners there is, he squeezed Hamilton County so bad that they ended up paying almost entirely half a billion dollars for a stadium, for the Paul Brown Stadium. And they've got a bunch of clauses in the contract that keep them on the hook. For example, they've got this giant jumbotron, right? Like, they're all very proud of their jumbotrons. Uh, we, we love our big screens, it's, con- it's in the contract that if another stadium in the NFL gets a bigger jumbotron, then the Hamilton County has to pay for the upgrade. Uh, Hang on. So that means every other team owner in the country basically has total control over the fate of Cincinnati. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like they could, they could at will, just using their own fortune, bankrupt the people of yes. Cincinnati. Yeah, bankrupt the public school system of Cincinnati by bringing a, building a bigger jumbotron. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, the size of the stadium. Well, there you but go. then we'd still have the biggest, we'd still have the biggest we screen, folks. Biggest Number screen one, biggest world. screen. And the, 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 the tourism of people coming to witness to the just see the screen. All hail the screen. the screen. And like the, the Vegas Raiders stadium is even more abominable because like there are no fucking Raiders fans in Las Vegas. I mean, I guess they just want people traveling to the games, which is going to happen, what, 16 games in NFL season, what, seven games a year yeah. in that stadium? That's the most like, monstrous thing about the NFL stadiums that are just for that game. It's You're talking about games, yeah. seven or eight games, maybe more if there's a playoff run, right. a year. Right. That is That means that the thing sits, hypothetically, sits empty. For over 350 days a year. 
Well, you know, I mean, let's, let's not say, I mean, they still have some municipal benefit as, you know, being a staging center for, let's say, you know, a, a military incursion yes. in the city. Or no, These are very useful Jade Helm staging areas. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I got to say, uh, uh, yeah, the, 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 the last 20 years of stadium building has really made me very nostalgic for the old 70s style municipal donut. <laughs> There's only one left, uh, the Coliseum in Oakland. Where it's like a concrete poured structure, not fancy. Doesn't it? Oh, it's oh, it's got an artisanal bistro at the in the second in deck, or oh, it's got it's got like real marble, or it's got uh, it's got like a, a yeah brownstone. It looks like Ebbets Field. No, just a big concrete donut, and they play football and baseball. Yep. And there's truck and there's and there's a uh, tractor pulls every other weekend. And when sticks comes to town, and they play there. Is there. Yes, and it's a hockey rink in the winter, and <laughs> there's always something happening. And that I would be down with if it was part of like a complex that was owned by the t- owned by the city. And the teams were also owned by the city. Now we're and talking. They, and they all had that cool brutalist architecture. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, the, the, uh, building the Raiders stadium actually is a good segue because that is Ballers season three. <laughs> and I want to talk about the pol- plot of Baller season one as a Ballers fan. <laughs> you and Elizabeth Warren. Yeah, I know. Uh, so th- you mentioned a few times the thing that about how the average career for an NFL player for like the, the rank and file NFL players, what, like three and a half years, something like yeah, that, maybe even less. The first, the, the premise of Ballers is that uh, The Rock is, it starts out as he's a, a wealth and business manager for football players, uh, and then later it goes on to him, like, personally buying the Cowboys or some shit. But it, it made me, it's a really interesting thing to think about, because you have the situation where you have, what, an opportunity of maybe a few years to make, as you were saying, not if you're not, a, like, a name player, not even a tremendous amount of money, but, you know, a couple hundred thousand over, mm-hmm. like, four years. Right. And that is, like, the career you've been working towards your entire life. So I guess I'm just wondering, like, what do you, you and the other, your other colleagues feel about is like the, how that sets you up for like forward planning in life and how that affects how you think about the world around you and how, and like politics and stuff. Yeah. I think it's, um, for me, I think it has to be something where it has to be a staging for the rest of your life. Like it has to be a prerequisite kind of to, to catapult you to something else in your life because it's such a short amount of time and such a short period, such a short you know period of your work life, it has to be something that it's not. I think that's why a lot of just athletes in general, but particularly NFL players, um, go broke once they're done playing is because they're used to either, they're used to making this money and then spending the money like they're going to be making it the rest of their life, but you're not. So you have to be incredibly intelligent about it, um, but it's something that. I think a lot of people struggle with it. A lot of players struggle with it. They don't have a lot of financial literacy coming into the league. And then you just, a lot of these people come from very poor, working class, lower middle class backgrounds, and you're thrust all this money, and then all of a sudden you're just spending it willy-nilly. But you have to understand that there's not a lot of job security in this. There's not, your contract's not guaranteed, all this type of stuff. So if anything happens, you, you hurt yourself, you can't play anymore, you have to sit out a year. All that stuff affects you, affects your life, affects your finances. So you just have to be more prepared to, um, you know, make your money while you're in it. And then once you're, you have to save, you have to just be ready to move on to another path. And that's what, for me, that's why I, I have a lot of other interests that I'm trying to explore. Um, because I know this isn't forever. Um, posting. I, yeah, posting, right? <laughs> being, being, being a part of the, the Twitter army for <laughs> Bernard Sanders in the, in the post wars. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'll be, you mentioned, uh, like, you know, fighting for, uh, the, like guaranteed lifetime healthcare. Yeah. Like that would be like one of the most important things, I guess. And considering what we are beginning to, you know, f- really first time realize about what football does to the human body and brain. I over- think it's like a big tobacco thing. And yeah. Just known it for decades and yeah, probably, the information. probably, Definitely. but at the same time though, I mean, like, again, you want to talk about connection to Bernie Sanders and political issues like Medicare for all. It's it's the same thing. same thing. It's like it's it's that security. And when you talk about you know football, I know a lot of people are asking themselves the question right now. If, you know, if I had a son, even though I, this game's given me so much and I, I love it so much, would I let him play football? You know, like given what we know about it. But the thing is, like like you said, you you have one shot at it. It's like three or four years, maybe like more if you're lucky to have like a, a really good career. It, it's sort of like you know. Even if you know it's like literally subtracting years off your life, how can you tell someone 
who's done this their entire life. It's the thing they love the most that, you know, not to take the opportunity to play it at its highest level, to experience that. And again, like, I think that would be a much, it's like the hardest question to answer. And I think that would be a much less like kind of savage choice to offer someone if there was something like guaranteed healthcare, either as a player or just for every citizen in this country, guaranteed healthcare your entire life. Like it'd be a more honest or like a, a fairer choice to make. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, like you said, there's a lot of parallels to, you know, Bernie's plan. Um, whereas like as an employee, right, if I lose my job, well, do I lose my health care? Right. Even if my union fought for it, if I'm not a part of that union anymore, I'm not part of the NFL anymore, not because of injury, just because of whatever. Well, I don't have health care anymore. Right. And that's exactly what um, the culinary union members saw through um, with, with their leadership and what they were trying to do. Um, and I think it's a it's really a decision that every single athlete has to make, and football players especially. Um, there have been guys that have retired um, early because of for fear of head injuries, or they just you know they were done with the game and they didn't want to risk it anymore. Um, you know, I've been very grateful enough to I've never had a concussion even playing the sport or the position that I play. I mean, yeah, you're a running back. That's like the yeah. shortest career, in right? NFL. Exactly. Yeah. So I've been I've been very lucky, but and I think a lot of you know, the people, I, my good friends on the team and stuff, we talk about, like, once, you know, if I start, you know, experiencing some neck issues, back issues, whatever, like, and I feel like it's going to affect the rest of my life, well, then I'm done. You know what I mean, I'm done because it's really not, it's not worth, um, I mean, once it once it's run its course, it's run its course, and it's not worth kind of putting yourself out there and risking yeah. the rest of your life anymore. Yeah. And, I mean, you're fortunate enough that you have options, such as posting, whereas <laughs> a lot of guys don't. Right. So yeah, sure. if, you're, if you're another NFL player listening on this right now, just get on Twitter. Just get, start, just get, start, start getting those memes out there. Start, <laughs> start, start, start get, get blocked by near attend. It's, you know? it's a, it's it's a, a proven touch. record now. Build up, build up your followers. Start a podcast. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Justin Jackson, I want to thank you so much for joining us. I want to thank you for uh, just coming to the show and hanging out with us. Thanks, thanks for following back. You know, I mean, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's been great. And it's thanks so for fun, coming to Nevada. Thanks for you know being an example to everyone by oh, yeah. going out. And canvas getting so pissed off like everyone else <laughs> is, and getting pissed off enough to do something and canvassing for the first time in your life—that's really fucking awesome. Yeah, that was yeah, awesome. Yeah, and like it just also let it be a lesson. Like, cool, successful people can also get involved in Twitter and the Bernie Sanders movement. <laughs> <laughs> there are cool posters. <laughs> you don't not just people who only post because they don't have anything else going on. <laughs> once again, Justin Jackson, I want to thank you. Appreciate you. Let's guys. just uh, once again go Badgers. Go Packers. No, yeah. no, 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 no. Go Brewers. No. Says, go uh, Bucks. Go, go Packers. Go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is infuriating. <laughs> Cheers, guys. Bye bye. Right. We're back. Well, it's Monday night. A new week has begun. I turn on my TV for some big skin fun. I see a Super Bowl season here on ABC. The biggest game each week is their specialty. I gotta get ready. Make everything right. Monday night football's coming on tonight.